following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. We are back. St. Louis Cardinal Baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and I'd like to introduce the two uh, co-hosts, as it were. Gene Hutmaker is here. Hi. Hey, Gene, and Al Blumkin. Hello there, everybody. How are you, gentlemen? You're doing fine, I presume. Yeah. It's... Yes, I'm doing okay. It's a little bit cold, but that's it's December in uh, New Jersey. Right. Um, but it isn't, it isn't even winter yet, which... I um, so... Winter here for about a month. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Yes, I meant technically. <laughs> yeah, technically, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry you're going through that, gentlemen. I'm in California. You guys are in uh, the Northeast. Alan is in Brooklyn. And, uh, gee, you're in New Jersey. I forget the town. Central, Central New Jersey, South Brunswick, New Jersey. Beautiful. Right, right Beautiful. between Princeton uh, and Rutgers. Uh, not too bad. You got a little academia there. How far from uh, right between the two? Pretty much. In fact, I used to run the New Brunswick Post Office, and uh, Rutgers used to get their mail from me. Okay, cool, cool. You know, George Case the Third is a Rutgers alum, right? And um, I have memories as, as a kid of uh, of watching Rutgers play teams like Manhattan and Seton Hall. Some good basketball back in those days. Rutgers was uh, really never never had a great team. Do you remember the best team Rutgers ever had? Bob Bobby I Boyd can... and uh, Jim Valvano. Oh, okay. Yeah, the, that's really going back some. Yeah, uh, we we had a, we had a player there from our high school, uh, Don L. Lumpkin. For a while, he had the three point record at Rutgers for a game. He graduated high school in the 1989. They were decent. Well, uh, my uh, boyhood. James Bailey was you there when James Bailey was there? Bailey was a little before him. Slam and Jam, and I I saw him. I saw him when my sons were small. We met him at a Burger King. My sons looking up to him like forever Mm -hmm. and ever and ever. He was real (laughs) friendly. Slam and Jamming. Slam and Jamming. Jamming. All right, let's talk uh, first a little Cardinal ball. We're going we're gonna to get to uh, the Hall of Fame selections momentarily. Uh, anything happening uh, in uh, that we could hot stove league about in terms of the winter meetings? Uh, uh, Cardinals made the big trade a couple of weeks ago. Uh, do they plan to stand pad? Is there any glaring needs as far as I, you I guess, see? Well, there's always need for... In my opinion, baseball now is before you needed a seventh and eighth inning setup, and now you need a sixth, seventh, and eighth inning setup. And it seems to get more and more important to have these setup men who nobody really knows from year to year. The Red Sox won it, and hardly anybody could know their guys in the sixth, seventh, and eighth innings. Well, you know, fantasy baseball sometimes mirrors regular baseball. Not all the time, but sometimes. Here's how it does. When you, when one picks a fantasy roster and it comes time to be choosing relief pitchers, it is so difficult because for one reason or another, relief pitchers don't stay consistent. From year to year, you have no idea what, the, what you're going to get. It's a bit of a crapshoot. And I'll ask you if if that's accurate, Al Blumkin. Is that a very oh, yeah. odd? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What okay. bugs me is that uh, you know they expect these guys to be consistent even day after day, and they're not. You know. And they're not because no. most times it's overuse. And um, there's something that from talking to Mark Littell, uh he told me an expression that they use. When overuse could be, the guy's not in the game, never got in the game, but you overuse him by uh, what they call a dry hump. That's the expression they use. You get up, you warm up, 
they don't put you in the game. An inning later, you get up, you warm up, they don't put you in the game. And that in itself is, can be construed as overuse if um, done improperly. So what I think is that managers just want to get the best they the most they can out of these guys, wring pitchers dry, and go to win for that year because who knows if they'll be managers next year. Well, the manager of Tampa Bay was quoted yesterday, Kevin Cash, saying they're going to use the opener or a thing like they play, like they did this past season, where they use five or six relief pitchers a game. They don't they right. they bring a relief pitcher, he goes uh, to start the game, he goes an inning and two thirds. Didn't Bobby Bregan try that way back? Well, that, that I, I, I don't remember. I, I remember that, that, uh, that in 1990 the Pirates were so short. Uh, when they got to the LCS against the Reds, that they used one game, they used the, uh, you know, started with relief pitches. I think for a while, Dark was going, Alvin Dark, when he had the Giants, was going to, guy pitches three innings, another guy pitches three innings, and the third guy pitches three innings. I don't, I can't document that, but it seems to be in my memory. No, that was all before analytics. Would right. say that the the third time batter faces a pitcher, the pitcher is a, at extreme disadvantage, which to me is nonsense. Well, it is nonsense because given the fact that you're going to bring in a relief pitcher who didn't make the starting rotation, so he's obviously um, a, a, an early inning relief pitcher is obviously questionably as good as the starter. So, um, and P- analytics is only good to analyze an entire year. Day by day, you got to go with, is the, is the pitcher feeling good? Is, how's his arm? How, you know, look. And, and, and John that, Fla- I, yeah, John Flaherty, who was a, uh, yeah, a major league catcher, and he, he's a Dust Yankee broadcast. Uh, said that uh, one of the reasons so several catchers like Gary Sanchez look so bad is that they're changing pitches every inning. That's right. another fact that a lot of people don't realize. Yeah, and they, they analyze something. The, the reason Darno with the Mets looks so bad is he's bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish the best could get somebody who could throw. How's that for analytics? Yeah. What do you I, do yet they tendered him. I'm they tendered him a contract, yeah. I, I know. That hmm. um, that made no sense to me because Policki came on to be fairly decent, and they got Nito coming up, and they're looking to sign another uh, – or sign a trade for a catcher. Uh, Rio Mundo is, with Miami uh, – Ramos is, and there's all kinds of catchers out there. Why would you tender that guy? I that I don't. Man, he spends most of these most of the season on a disabled list. Anyway, and when he's not, yeah. he can't throw out. He can't throw out my mm. grandmother. Um, of course, you lost a little speed there has in the last <laughs> forty years since she's not been alive, but. That's another story for another day. Gene, anything that stands out about the winter meetings relating to the Cardinals? Uh, they yeah, like they got the biggie with Goldsmith, and uh, the, I think they're just standing pat and see what see what falls out because keeping tabs on what Milwaukee's trying to do. I heard Milwaukee's trying to get some somebody pretty good, and uh, also you know the, the Cubs. Uh, actually, some places said right now whoever does the ratings, the Cardinals are right now are like one game behind the Cubs. Okay, uh, uh, Pirates are in that right division, now. Al, and you're a Pirate fan? Yeah, well, the Pirates today signed a uh, pitcher named Jordan Wilds, who uh, I looked him up on reference after I saw that. He's 31-52 and 52 lifetime with a 528 ERA. So I put that out in the Pirate chat group on Facebook then, and I said, this, I'm sure this guy is going to help a lot. That the corner is turned with them. That's yeah, oh, yeah. 
Okay, them and Cincinnati will be in the same boat. Hmm. Well, they're better than the Reds. They said the Reds are going after Real Muto. I don't know what they have to give up. And they, they've got a contract uh, with this pitcher, Homer Bailey. Last year was 1-14 with ERA of over six, and they have to pay him for, for three more years. I have a negative feeling that the Mets are going to end up giving Rosario up for Rio Min- Mindo and signing a um, well, a, a kid that uh, is no longer a kid. That he's pretty much o- over the hill to Lewinsky to play short, and they're going to say that's a stopgap. Well, the, 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 uh, 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 he's owed $38 million from the, the, the deal he signed with the Rockies a number of years ago. No, but I no. I think Toronto picks up uh, is on. Well, the- Toronto has to pick if they sign him. You know, the, the, they say he's a free agent now because Ta- Toronto released him. Right. So the, if the Mets sign him, it, uh, Toronto's still paying the bulk of what he's owed. They could sign him for for a, a reasonable amount. Now, the guy's been on a DL. Uh, he hasn't played since uh, uh, I know. August I know. of, of 2017. Kind of guys. Why, why, are you going, why, why do you want these types for? I, d- d- because what they're looking for is power. Who knows what he has left? He hasn't played I, in a year. And a, a, he, was a, year. He, he was the course. He has the course thing about him, too. Yeah, the course field thing, yeah. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, let's get to the Hall of Fame guys. Oh. And I, uh, okay, I, let's start with a positive note. I think Smith is uh, is in, and I think that's good. Yeah, I have no problem with him. Okay. Um, Gene? Well, problem with uh, one of my criteria is I want a closer to have a ring. I understand that. You know, it's a team effort and everything, but the one one thing about a closer, he's in there at the end of the game, and I, I want a closer to have a ring. And I probably wouldn't have voted for Hoffman. Uh, okay. the, 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 the safe formula is so skewed anyway. It's like, you know, with a three-run lead in the ninth inning, I mean. Yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's a 30-3 game uh, 10 years ago at Texas beat Baltimore, and some pitcher on Texas pitched the last three innings and got a save for that. Yeah, that's part of the record. If you play yeah. the last three innings, and uh, yeah, you can come up with thirty yeah. play twenty-seven run lead like he didn't get to say. I mean, personally, I would have, I would have the Kansas City Quiz Quisenberry and yeah. uh, Stickman to Colby over Smith, in my opinion. But uh, Smith's a good guy, and I'm glad for him. But I, I wouldn't have voted for him. And he accumulated a lot of numbers, but you know what? With a relief pitcher. That should be a plus, a guy who could accumulate a lot of numbers. That's I met him at a, at a B8 at a bat dinner, and he's he's a good guy. And I'm not that that okay. bad for, you know, your, your ball field excellence, but he's he's a good guy, too, where, like, an Albert Bell isn't. Uh, that brings me to an excellent point, and I think I've covered this on other podcasts. How much of it is a popularity contest with the writers? And we've ta- I know we've talked to Hal Bach, um, um, Alan and I, about this. And he's mentioned some guys that were just prickly and you really... Well, Steve Carlton, Steve Carlton hated them and he, they still voted them in the first time. So they didn't like Murray. Yeah, either, but, they? but there was, the guy had more... The guy had numbers. Than, uh, by the, for the right reasons. Yeah. But when it's on the borderline, and I'll give you a good example, we're talking, um, or I was talking somewhere, I only talk baseball seven days a week, um, every week, which I'm in heaven, by the way, doing it. But um, the guy that comes to mind is Schilling, who's a borderline Hall of Famer. You can make a case for him. I think he's overboard a lot. Like you made a case for Blylevin, you can make a case for him. But there aren't too many writers that are going to take the bait on that case in their heads because they were either snubbed by him or they're so turned off to his radical, idiotic ideology. 
Do they not like Kent? Jeff Kent, I heard he was thoroughly. Same same reasons. Well, he's on a ballot, Kent. Plus, Again, yeah. yeah but, he's, but he's not you doing know, well. Kent has hit more home runs than any of the second baseman. And with a two ninety two uh, average. But that's pretty solid. Um, for a second yeah. baseman, yes. Yeah. For, you know. yeah, all those home runs with the 292. And um, I don't think they got rings with the Giants. But, no, but, uh, he, but he, he has an MVP, too. So he, had, he did have a signature season. Right. And, yes, that's a good cri- criteria. My criteria along those lines is did a guy dominate his position in the time he played? And... Um, well, that was a standard at one time. That was a standard at one time. Uh, how come that isn't anymore? Because of Frisch and, uh, to a lesser extent, Geringer and the Veterans Committee, when they first established that, and they, they met after, either 46, I think it was, after World War II, they started putting in tons of guys with very dubious credentials. And well, then they, uh, they, Frisch... They, they very good stats, but not... not yeah, fame. and then Frisch, uh, uh, and to us, that Geringer put in guys on the veteran committee uh, a lot of whom have no business being there. Geringer, who Geringer, Geringer was pretty tough. Pretty tough. Oh, he got the Rick Farrell in there. I don't know. I don't, that was him? Yeah. No. Yeah, the wrong Farrell was in there. Yeah, and uh, oh, Frisch, yeah. the, the pitcher got more home. The wrong the um, little poison and big poison. I think some of those guys thought they were voting for big poison. No, he went in early. He was by far the better of the two. Lloyd Weiner was put in by the Veterans Committee later. Paul was a uh, uh, writer's uh, writer's, uh, uh, candidate. He went in right away. He was was an easy pick. Yeah. But, uh, for example, uh, one of the – because Frisch had these – you know, with the Giants and with the Cardinals – he put like, he got a, a pitcher named Jesse Haynes, who won 210 games in 18 seasons. And there's a site online that the guy the guy puts up pictures of birthdays for all the Hall of Famers. So they put up one of Haynes, and I said the only way this guy should be in there is by buying a ticket. And he, he and he didn't like my negativity on this. Well, his, his record is similar post. to, but his record is similar to like a Rube Marquard. Yeah, well, Mark White doesn't belong either. Yeah, yeah I'm saying, he's, I mean, there's, there's other people that have, even Newhouser, who had the great warriors, uh, you know, even, even, well, Drysdale, with, uh, he has like 209 wins, so. Yeah, with Drysdale, you, you throw out three, 57, uh, I think it's 57, 62, and 65, he's 500. Right. Yeah. He, he was, well, being on the Brady Bunch and Donna Reed probably helped him. Yeah, also, when you get into that 200, uh, to two, two, the 200 to 225 era. He wasn't era. on Donna Reed. He was on the show. By the area. Way. You got into the Just 200 to 225 area. area. You got pitchers like Drysdale and Bunning that are in. And you got pitchers like Tiant and the, uh, Billy Pierce that are not in. Right, right. Yeah, I think right. About the Billy Pierce Rogers. should be in. No question yeah, about that. And, and Tiant. Al is the one who enlightened me to him. And he did so well with the 62 Giants. There was no, no question that they would not have won. I, I had dinner with him at, a, at dinner, and uh, I, I, I don't know if anybody knows, but if if the Giants tied it, he was going in in the tenth inning. Oh, really? Yeah, he was. He told me he was. I was sitting with him and his wife, and he said he was, he was getting ready to go into the tenth inning if they tied that game to McCovey lineout. And you know the famous story: both Mays and Alou, the Felipe Lou, said that. Because Matty was so small of stature that he, if they were going for the plate, they both would have, would have taken the plate. They were big guys, and um, they would have done anything to take the plate at that. Well, they would have been out. They would have probably been out by a lot, but there would have been the collision. Yeah, Pierce was on the uh, got a World Series ring with the 1945 Tigers when he was 18. He was on the roster because, uh, you know, most of them were in the, the Army at that point. Um, yeah, he was, uh, people don't remember he was traded to the White Sox from the Tigers. What was yeah, you know, the, you know, it's a very funny story because the Yankees had this catcher, Aaron Robinson, and they 
put him with uh, two mediocre pitchers before 1948 and shipped him to the Yankees Freddie Lopat. So from, from the Yankee, Yankee shipped him to the White Sox Freddie Lopat, and then uh, the the White Sox, the Tiger the White Sox turned around and traded Aaron Robinson uh, even up for Billy Pierce. This guy was a very expensive uh, mediocre catcher. <laughs> He, he was a great guy because I, yeah. uh, I, I was promoted. I even got it in my book that I, I you know, Billy Pierce should probably be in the Hall of Fame. And so his, his wife. Well, I'm a big uh, advocate of many men also. Yeah, well, that, that, that's another one. They didn't put him in for the black. No, I know that because they said his. I asked uh, one of the guys at the uh, one of the uh, Negro League authorities at the Saber Convention in Pittsburgh. I said, "Why? Well, I said his, his Negro League career, career wasn't long enough. Okay. It was two years or something like that." Well, in his birth date is kind of like uh, his baseball cards have him born in 1922 and 1925. So I have the the, the Bowman. Even in my book, I got the, the 1925. Yeah, because that's what he has in his autobiography. Yeah, mm-hmm. there are a lot of, a lot of players in those years. There's a rift between African Americans and blacks from uh, Latin America. Uh, there were a lot of players back then. Uh, how, if, you know, baseball cards I shaved years off. That's true. That's absolutely Well, I, I had the honor of escorting Minnie Minoso at one of the Major League Players Association dinners. Yeah. Brooks Robinson runs. And during a cocktail hour, I, I was with Minnie and his uh, son uh, telling people how great he was. He was all, you know, oh, you know I had the hit. honor of having Burt Campanaris in the back seat of the yellow Toyota, the famous yellow Toyota in my life, uh, taking him to a, an A's reunion that I got to sit and um, meet Alvin Dark and uh, a myriad of these guys. But uh, Campy was my uh, buddy's uh, real close friend, and I want to ask you both, should Campanaris be considered for the Hall of Fame? No, a lot of people compare him with uh, Concepcion. Right, but he was faster. Yeah, but they're, 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 they're both quality people, quite quality players. Maybe they're even better than Rizzuto and uh, Reese to some degree. But Reese and Rizzuto have all the uh, the golden years of uh, New York. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Right, and they had the press for a long time. New York press. A lot of people I think know. they don't belong. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'll ask you this, Gene. Because you you are a Cardinal fan, and this is a Cardinal show. Enos Slaughter belongs, doesn't belong. Well, okay, Enos Slaughter has a 2,300 hits. He lost three prime years. He, he, he was like in the MVP talk when he left and when he came back. So he lost three years, and he has 2,300 hits with a 300 batting average. Uh, twice he was number three in MVP voting. He's like a nighttime all-star. And uh, with a 300 average, and, uh, uh, and the, the real, real great, great. I mean, he, you know, he even went to the hated Yankees, and he helped them win the 1956 World Series. Yeah, he turned that series they, they, around by hitting a three-run home run in Game Three. Made him cry for yeah. a week. Yeah. But, uh, no, 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 I, I think you know, forget what he did with Robinson. He was a. Uh, I think it's, it's, that's definitely warranted because he's yeah, you three almost read years. my mind. You almost read my mind. He met three forget prime what years. He did or didn't do with Robinson. I, well, I, I, I heard him being interviewed on uh, uh, maybe with Francesca on uh, the New York uh, show, and uh, he right. was explaining. He was explaining. I'm a hard player. He had his foot in the wrong place, basically, is what he said. Okay. How do you that remember his, that, Al Blanc? That, I mean, that was like the Machado thing, you know. Well, I don't remember him. You know, that was two, I was four years old when they played the first, first year against the Dodgers. But I thought his numbers were... It would justify. He was a, a, a prominent player on a team that, uh, you know, especially in the, uh, you know, in the forties where he was good. He came to the Yankees and he was a positive force. Okay. Even if they farmed him out to the A's for a year and a half, you know, they brought him back. They brought him back. In fact, that's when they cut Rizzuto. Was when they uh, reacquired the uh, Slaughter from uh, the Kansas City A's. I, I think, yeah, I think, was I think, that I think, some cold potatoes on that one? Oh, George Weiss was. Uh, I, I, somebody interviewed me once on uh, on uh, 
uh, George Weiss for a TV series. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if it ever came out. I wanted to say that uh, Weiss would have made a great commander of a Nazi death camp. Right. But I decided not to use that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Reese, who was, uh, Reese, Rizzuto, who was like the glue of the Yankee infield for for years, five championships in a row. Yeah, he also missed uh, three years in the military. Yeah, but he only he still only had fifteen hundred hits. That would I know that. Yeah, twenty one hundred. Well, he tailed off after nineteen fifty three. Couldn't hit anymore. Okay. He had one ninety something in nineteen fifty four and. That was basically it. Yeah, I, I, I had yeah. a baseball glove, and kids want to know whose glove you had. And I said, Rizzuto, nobody wanted to have a glove of a guy. Uh, Hitting under 200, yeah. Numbers. So I had to, luckily Stan Musial moved to first base, so I got myself a Stan Musial yeah. glove. Well, a first baseman glove anyway. Now you talk about a player. I had a Stan Musial glove. I had a right-handed Stan Musial glove. Yeah, so did I. And I, had, and I had a first base. I have paint, a left-handed paint. Billy Martin glove. I also had a right-handed Billy Martin glove as a kid. So, um, long story, I broke my, the finger on my left hand, can't put a glove into it, I could still throw. Bought a left-handed fielder's mitt, and I'm learning to throw left-handed, so I could still have a catch with my buddies every now and again. And in 1992, the Sabre National was in St. Louis, and there was a panel up there, and I was near the front of the room there, and all of a sudden, there's a buzz in the back of the room. It was musical. He came in unannounced. He, when he got up to the uh, podium there, we gave him a 10-minute standing ovation. Wow. And we, we gave him a, an honorary membership. And uh, in the old days, when they printed the directories, you used to have to listen, list your expertise. And he put down hitting a baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Most of it was... Hunting or fishing? Yeah. And or fishing? Yeah. Uh, that was the basic. Let's face it, baseball in those days and pretty much today, too, if it weren't for California uh, and Florida, that's not technically the South. But baseball is a good old country game, hardball. It was mostly played uh, by um, by players who had the seasons, like you play up north, you live up north, Yeah, you're limited to how many games you can play a year, how much practice you can get. Southern kids have the advantage. and Now you have the Caribbean. Yeah. yeah. Now it's the, right, exactly. Now, Musio, uh, uh, by his standards, a bad year in 1947, he played the whole season with a fr- frozen appendix. Because he felt he, if they, he had it taken out, uh, he'd miss too much time. And you know, it's also interesting that the year before Musial retires, he hit like 265. And he his pride would not let him retire on that number. And he comes back, and I don't know if he hit 300. He hit 330, he hit 30. like 62. Yeah. Came in third. Yeah, oh, whoa. Yeah, the, it was also the year of expansion, Yeah, and he, if I remember, he did very well against the Mets. I don't know how he did. I, I was there when he hit the four home. He has the record for four homers before it passed over two games. I was there. Yeah, I, uh, was that the I remember getting very, very excited when he approached uh, uh, 3,000 hits because it had only been done seven times, and the last one before him was Paul Weiner, and that was 16 years earlier. When, when he had 3,000 hits, his bat, lifetime batting average was 341. Yeah, well, yeah, Ted Williams well, dropped also because Yeah, but of, uh, Williams hit 316 this last year. Yeah, but he hit 255 the year before. Yeah, yeah, uh, but the next he, he, only had, he only had the one year. He used yeah. to have four bad years or four mediocre years. His, his, so his, his yeah, dropped I don't like know if I've points. told this story, and I'll, I'll bore Al for a second if I have, but Shea Stadium opens, or last year the Polo Grounds, I can't remember which, Musial comes in to play the Mets, and my parents have these friends from Argentina. They were Sephardic Jews, and they bring up, oh, not Argentina, Brazil, and they bring with them to visit their daughter, who was Miss Junior Brazil. And, whoa, my God, they say, entertain her for the day. She speaks no English, I speak no Spanish. But she Portuguese. Was and musical. 
Yeah. And Stan Musial was going to play, and my mother says, you buy box seats and entertain them. So we're right behind the dugout. Here comes Stan Musial in, and she says, Stan Musial, fa Stan Deman, fantastic. <laughs> and he looks up, and he goes, you're not all that unfantastic yourself, young lady. No. So, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, you're pretty fantastic yourself. <laughs> so um, Stan had an eye. You know, give him that. It wasn't all har- harmonica and um, and baseball. And the reason he gets some short shrift like he did in the Ken Burns documentary is because uh, he wasn't – you know, he wasn't nearly, he had no controversy about him. It wasn't like, uh, you know, Ted Williams or Joe DiMaggio, both of whom had plenty. And yeah, that was very disappointing for me, that the Ken Burns series about Sam they, 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 they only mentioned, if you did the, when they did the thing on the 40s, the only three players you thought that played in the whole decade were, were uh, Williams, DiMaggio, and Jackie Robinson. Right. Well, a lot of it must depend on how much footage a, a documentary have on the guys. And um, now Musial was not was not controversial. He gave Musial right. short shrift, uh, you know, one line in the thing on the six. Playing in the Midwest and all, yeah. and all that, um, no question. He also got short shrifted. Sports Illustrated came out with this all-time all-star team and with these beautiful pictures. I even have a book on that, and I think Stan Musial was an afterthought to that, if I remember correctly. They either left him off or gave Maybe him... Maybe because there's no, no baseball cards on him for quite a while. Well, he was, he was Sports <clears throat> Illustrated Man of the Decade in 45 and 55. If I naturally had the copy, because I had anything Musial I bought by, I was 10 years old. Yeah. He was the uh, Player of the Decade from 45 to 55. Um, I almost remember that sporting news coming out. Um, yeah, well, the, the 1948 season was unbelievable. He led the league in everything except uh, his one shot on home runs. They, they said it was rained out, but that's controversial as well. Yeah. He had the one rained out. Or but not. everything else, uh, doubles, triples, uh, slugging, uh, war, on base, everything. He, uh, he led the, uh, else he and, led the league in. It's amazing it wasn't the Dodgers that won it, but the Braves. Yeah. And he used to hit all, own Ebbets Field. Yeah. That's where he got this nickname, Stan the Man. He, he was the Denora Greyhound. He didn't yeah. want to talk about five tool, but because of his speed, he was known as the Denora Greyhound. Right. That's interesting. And you know who else came from Denora? The Griffey family, if I'm not Born mistaken. on the same day. Yeah. Junior. Wow. Well, Stan Musial played ba- high school basketball with. with with, with Ken Griffey Sr.'s dad, there, there, there was a picture. But uh, I, I saw, I saw the picture of the team. Uh, Ken Griffey's uh, father was grandfather. You mean? Yeah, well, well Junior's grandfather. I'm in a group Very called sweet. Baseball Sweet Sixteen. Uh, it's with my friend Jim Howell in Pittsburgh, and what it is, you know, it stops at the, you know, after the, when the 18 leagues gone, and I put up. Uh, on uh, November 21st, uh, well, it was November 20th. Yeah, November 20th, I think, is his birthday. Usual. Right. Mm-hmm. I put up a, 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 a you know a thing that today is the would have been the 98th birthday of uh, Stan Musial, the great Cardinal Hall of Famer. I got quite a few likes on that. The one and only player that I that I've followed over the years that compares to Musial in class and in reputation because of his class is Monty Irvin. Um, they're pretty much the, the same. Just you can't, Nobody could ever say anything bad about Monty Irvin. Yeah, Yogi was like that. Yeah, Yogi was like that, but Yogi had a bit of an edge to him, too, which was good. Um, and he became a little embittered, uh, a little. Uh, he didn't go to Yankee Stadium for 15 years. Well, that's because Steinbrenner, when they fired him in 1985, Steinbrenner had one of his flunkies, though. He wouldn't do it himself. Plus, he told him to stay the whole year. 
Yeah. The way he handled Yogi, he should have given Yogi the keys to the car for as long as he wanted to drive it under any circumstances. Well, that's what he did when uh, DiMaggio died in uh, March 1999. Yogi became the living, leading living Yankee ac- ac- icon, and uh, Susan Walden, the Yankee broadcaster, arranged it, and uh, Steinberg had to go crawling out to Yogi in the museum to beg him to come back. Well, his granddaughters have something. That they, yeah. they, they influenced him a lot. Yeah, and I think his wife, Carmen, influenced him a lot. Yeah, and I was there that day he came back, and that was the day David Combe pitched the perfect game. Yeah, I, I, I went to a book signing, and uh, him and Garagiola were signing a book there. I, I was there with a half hour with Carmen. She was telling, we were telling stories. In fact, I, I gave I gave her a book, Band in the Bronx, for uh, for Yogi. <laughs> she was, you know, she took. Yeah, she showed up at a meeting out there, and... Uh, <clears throat> She was a piece of work. She told two, two, two stories, which I repeated. One time she got an anniversary card from him and signed your husband, Yogi Berra. <laughs> and the other one was when uh, uh, they were at some affair with, and Rachel Robinson was there. Rachel asked Carmen if she had a dance with Yogi, and Carmen said yes. And she called Yogi over and says, whatever you do, don't bring up that play. <laughs> It didn't matter uh, because the Yankees won that game. Yeah, I, I know that, yeah. I don't yeah. understand all the commotion it's about taken it. It's mythology, um, taken mythological proportions on, uh, on I mean, that. It's like uh, they won the game 6-5. That was the last run the Dodgers scored. Yeah, I know. And uh, I asked Dale Barra at one of the meetings there if you, you know, your father ever got as mad as you did on that play. And he said, only one we talked back to one mother. Yeah. <laughs> he he had to be out, or Yogi would not have reacted that way. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. I I I think his glove. I, I think his glove was in the middle of the plate, and Jackie hit the plate before he hit the glove. Who knows? Uh, it's, it's over it's saying, six, you know, sixty-three years ago, and there's a million arguments on both both sides. It wasn't part of the score. It didn't change the score. I know that. Yeah. yeah. Hey, before we go, we started with the positive about the Hall of Fame, and Smith is, uh, by all three of our standards, uh, worthy enough to get in, if not be a top-tier Hall of Famer. Now, he'd, he'd, be, he'd be bottom rung. Yeah. Right. But he'd be in legitimately by any standards. Yeah. Well, basically, the Hall of Fame has two tiers. You have the writers and you have the veterans. I mean, it's, 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 no matter how you slice it, some people want to make different. Like, like is Harold Baines as good as Babe Ruth? But they're both Hall of Famers. Okay, but one, no, one, that's one's not the my argument. Is Harold Baines as good as Dick Allen? Is now, he doesn't even belong in my in my opinion. And uh, uh, somebody put the quote the looser when he was criticized about Baines because he and Weinstorf, the owner of the White Sox, were two of the oh, ones on this committee that were pushing him, and. Uh, you know, Lelousa has a habit of, if you disagree with him, you're an idiot on anything. Well, Lelousa La- 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 and uh, Russo went over it. Lelousa goes, who has, who has more ability to pick somebody for the Hall of Fame? These guys just sit and do nothing and write about it or us people that are on the field? That was Lelousa's thing against Russo. Russo well, I'm not a voter. That's uh, nonsense. Yeah, Ru- that, well, that says is this, absolute nonsense. Well, I'm saying that, 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 that was Tony LaRusso's thing is the players. Yeah, the, 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 the writers make the writers make much fewer mistakes over the years than the than the uh, veterans committee has. Well, that, that that that's his argument on it. But yeah, I know. Yeah, but, well. but, but Harold Baines, uh, the the Hall of Fame has a sense of longevity, and Baines did have they love longevity. Hits. They love longevity. He had the most hits and RBIs. If anybody, like somebody says, like okay, Mattingly, like who would you rather have? Who would you really rather have up at the plate, Will Clark or Baines? Will Clark. Who would you, well, no question, Will Clark. Yeah, but the, yeah. they're OPSs. He's a, he's a he's a uh, uh, Baines is a uh, accumulator. Yeah, yeah but, but, and I have his I have his page on the reference open right now. The guy had no se- no seasons where he scored a hundred runs. Had three seasons of a hundred RBIs. His OBA career was 356, which isn't all that great. The guy was never dominant, and he was never, nobody ever went to a game, oh, i, I got to go to this game because I want to see Harold Baines. 
Well, the whole thing is the longevity where he had the 28. Like, if people are going to argue for Garvey and these other people with 20. Well, he got 28. Do they have 2,800 hits or 1,600 RBIs? And yeah, he, he, he did. One other factor, guys. He plays in Chicago. La Russa is a Chicago, was a, his manager in Chicago. Yeah. And Reinsdorf was the owner. He played with Alomar, who was on the committee. Yeah, well, and yeah. Uh, the whole bunch of, uh, he has a whole bunch of influence people on the committee that did, yeah. he, did he have a connection with. And the they whole thing. Boy, I, told, the I, I told Ralph last night they put. Chicago will fill up Cooperstown when it comes time to inducting him. They, they, they put Joe Gordon in two years ago, or, or whatever the last time they were met, and you look at him, him and he's no Hall of Famer either. Uh, I'm not good. saying he wasn't very good, very but very good he's Hall of Famous, the two different, you know, you're dealing with two different uh, sets there. Yeah, he only has 1,500 hits. So I know he lost two years to World War II, but he only has Yeah, uh, you talk about compiler. Eddie Murray hit 500 home runs. Without ever, without ever hitting more than 33 in a season. When those guys were put put in, um, there wasn't the absolute outcry of disagreement as there was with Harold Baines. Well, he got 6% of the vote. He got, never got more than 6% of the vote right. by the writers. Right. Never. And. I say, and Clark was on the same back. Clark only missed it by one vote, and that's no, no, Penella. Penella missed by one. No, Clark no, I think they include, include the oh, managerial Penella, record right. in there. Clark didn't right. get five. Mm. Oh, he did. No. Okay, but Baines did. Baines got twelve. Yeah, twelve out of sixteen, he got. Um, so it is so. Uh, at best, it's object. It's, it's subjective. And at worst, it's just crooked. Let's put it that way. It's how they flavor it. Like, I like to me, I, I think they'd like to see Oliva in. If Oliva's a good guy, in my, my opinion, I don't know. If they want to try and flavor for for Minnesota for uh, Oliva, uh, I think. Yeah, well, he won three team. bank titles. If he yeah, no, me, I, 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 I Look, one of my criteria is 2,000 hits with exceptions. And Oliva and Ad Dick Allen uh, would be two of my exceptions. And Gil Hodges, too, because he was a Marine for. Two years, three years. No, I was name and also. Well, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Minoso had the color line. Yeah, the color line. Yeah. The color line that is the shilling factor that I talked about in your mind. Shilling is a son of a bitch. The guy who was the marine hero over the guy, uh, uh, if all things being equal, and you're human. I don't begrudge you that. I'm just saying there's a lot of subjectivity. I think they. The, the Hall of Fame to value itself with this, with this, this one. They used to have one veterans committee. Now they have one for, you know, that, that they give artificial errors. You know, and they meet every few years and they're going to put people, uh, on the committees for each year who basically saw these people play. But the whole thing with Reinsdorf being on the committee, the owner of, you know, they retired Baines's number on the White House before he retired from playing. That's unheard of. Right. Right. Hey, guys, good show. I enjoy your company, both of you, and I want to thank everybody out there for listening. It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm lucky enough to have spoken this evening with Al Blumkin. Alan, thank you. Okay, Gene, I just want to tell you, I think the Goldsmith trade was a steal for the Cardinals. Yeah, uh, yeah. like I say, the whole thing is, like nowadays, you're sixth, seventh, and eighth inning pitchers. Not your closer well, or not your lineup. Now you got to take the crapshoot on next year's release. That's, that's what it is. That's, that, that's the exact term. Yeah. Uh, you know, Gene, I, I always come on thinking, boy, i got to put Gene in his place and argue with him and he, his view on this, that, and that. But you soften it so much. You have such a nice nice way of presenting it. Um, I just think you... You think more mediocre players, not mediocre, very good players should be in the Hall of Fame as opposed to the greats, I think. Well, I would, I would even probably look, look at Mike, Mike, Mike Young, Michael Young, 300, 300 lifetime average with 2,300 hits, one in batting crown, and also Johnny Damon, who's 32nd in runs scored, and 59 of the players that, were, that are clean, 
that are all in the Hall of Fame who have uh, run scored. Uh, okay, well, yeah, Gene, I want, I want to ask you, what do you think about Mike Messina? I think he has like nine Hall of Famers type seasons, so I'd vote for him. I mean, yeah, I yeah he, you know, if he would have stayed around for another two years, he would have, he would have been an automatic. Yeah, that was kind of surprising. But the, but to me, uh, uh, I had dinner with Tommy John, and we were talking. We were talking about Musina being in, and he almost fell off the chair laughing. He should I be in social gym. You know. He should be in social gym cut. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. Well, you know, everybody who goes in wants to close the doors behind them. Let's put it that way. Yeah, they don't want anyone. They don't want, once they're released, they don't want anybody else. <laughs> right. John Morgan right. took a fit when Sandberg got in. Yeah. Well, I I would have too, but no more fit than I would have thrown with Mazeroski getting in. And not that he's not a really good ball player, but a Hall of Famer. I he got in because of his defense. I mean, if they put right. uh, Louis Aparicio and Ozzy Smith in there, we're not exactly you know Babe Ruth with the bats. Mazeroski's not in because of the home run. He's in because of the defense. Oh, that that helps. No, that no helps. Yeah. No question, but Sandberg's defense wasn't all that bad. Oh, and he, was, yeah, he, was, he was a gold lover. But the thing about Mazeroski, it was a Pittsburgh Joe Brown or whatever. They, there was a, a Pittsburgh-flavored committee when Mazeroski got in. And supposedly oh, after that, I heard that it was arranged that the, the next veterans, they were going to put Hodges in, and then they changed the whole format. All these committees are tainted in some way with prejudice. For instance, what kept Gil Hodges out was Ted Williams holding a grudge because of their respective popularities in Washington. And um, I don't remember if he didn't count Campy's vote, if that was no, he w- he w- he, the he The rule was uh, you had to be there, and I, I, I guess yeah, that they Campy, agreed to wait, but they could have. Who at best was a quadriplegic, and... At worst, he couldn't get out of the, out of the room, and he couldn't make an exception on that. He had the phone hook up. He had the line. That was Bush. And I well, really, Williams didn't like National Leaguers except for Musial. Right, and again, he had a particular grudge against. Um, yeah, yeah, because because they're, they're both managing in Washington. Another thing that Musial and Williams, they they, they both agreed to support Shane Dins and Bobby Doerr. You, you know, you, you, you promote, you promote. Well, that's a trade-off. I didn't, I didn't know that. I never heard that one before. They, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. Supposedly yeah. that they agreed to use their influence to, to get, I mean, they're, they're both okay as far as I'm concerned. Or yeah. Changes, but, but, that, but they, hey, um, I influence. just want to say that, um, today's date is the, the 12th of December and I witnessed Alan Blumpkin learning something. <laughs> I thought you were going to say today, today is the 103rd birthday of Frank Sinatra. Well, uh, old blue eyes. Yeah. Um, well, I, my buddy told me this story a long time ago. He says, Frank Sinatra saved my life. Um, getting the, um, Frank Sinatra came along and says, um, you hit him enough, Louis. <laughs> that, that, that's enough. <laughs> um well, Frank Sinatra yeah. and Hoboken, that's where baseball started, at least in fields. I, I yeah, know, cannot yeah. tell you how much Frank goes into my head. The Frank on stage, not the off-stage Frank. He had a lot of uh, shortcomings as a human, as a lot of us do. But on stage, um, unbelievable, unbelievable. And if you put that Rat Pack on 24-7 on stage, where does your eye gravitate to? Sinatra. Well, he wasn't a bad actor either. He was pretty good in a few movies. No, but... Well, I know, but... Yeah. Dean Martin had the stage. And if you go back and watch on YouTube, watch some Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis early stuff. Oh, my God, they were talented. Oh, my... Uh, I, you don't have to like Jerry Lewis, and, you know, ladies, uh, hello, ladies. Um, that's not the point. The they point said Dean is, Martin was going to, his career was going to go down the tubes after they broke up. Right. And they both, if you look at it, Jerry Lewis got international fame. He was, uh, for one reason or another, 
um, popular in in, um, in France. It seems that he was popular. Showers were never popular in France. <laughs> but <laughs> Jer- Jerry Lewis, go figure. Um, and, but on stage together, they and the way I judge it is if you ever see it, see their clips on YouTube. Look at the band. They always had a band that they were playing to, and the the band would just break up. I mean, yeah, well, one of the first movies I saw, I was ten, was The Caddy, where D- Dean Martin introduced that some more. Uh, and yeah. I thought, you know, I was ten years old, I thought it was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Now, not so much. <laughs> yes, not so much, of course. But uh, their stage act. Uh, and musically, Jerry Lewis was uh, incredible. And Dean's voice, I mean, uh, he's, still, uh, he's still on commercials. And, um, and you listen to him, wow. Uh, and, you know, I'm, Christmas music is playing, and I'm not all that big on Christmas music. But you throw in a Dean Martin, he could be singing the phone book, and it wouldn't matter. I know that, yeah. Yeah. But Frank, with his gestures and his, and his uh, uh, enunciation of the words, and um, yeah. uh, fr- uh, and you know, while we're at it, we got to give uh, the third member of, of the Rat Pack, Sammy Davis Jr., uh, enough can't be said about his talents. Yeah, the the, the uh, for, uh, Gene mentioned Manchurian Candidate. I, first time I saw that, I was totally blown away. By it. There was How about a, the uh, uh, Gene Kelly with the baseball? Oh, uh, take me out to the ball game. I just saw that recently. Uh, I was on TCM with, about a month the ago. Wolves. They, they, yeah. They yeah. Oh, O'Brien to Ryan to Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, do you think Harry Steinfeld would have been in the Hall of Fame if they put him in the poem? Possibly. Yeah. One, one, one last question: Should George Steinbrenner be in the Hall of Fame? No, he, he was banned twice. From no. Okay, should Trump be on Mount Rushmore? No. Anyway, uh, I was going to say I that if, if so you look either. at I don't think so either, Al. If you look at the Johnny Evers and Billy Martin, they're essentially the same player with two sixty hitters in the regular season, and when they got to the World Series, they would turn it up uh, a whole bunch of notches. And. Evers gets in. I see Evers gets in, and Billy Martin, that. Billy Martin, because of his, you know, uh, peccadillos, will not. I don't think he'll ever get in either. Billy Martin was not a Hall of Fame player. No, peccadillos. He was Johnny Evers or Joe Tinker, but they're in. But they didn't have a poem, Evers. No, I didn't have a poem right after them. Yeah. And they did. They, 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 they hated each other too. Or, 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 I know that they didn't speak for years. I mean, it was like it's all about another one of my favorites. They'll never get in. Uh, is Dominic DiMaggio. Well, the war, that, the war hurt him really. Hurt too, him too, but, yeah. I mean, it's three prime years. Hey, how about Whitaker? If Trammell's in, we got to put in Whitaker. Whitaker got 2% of the vote from the writers. Yeah, they were comparing Bates to Trammell in the paper. 2%. But Trammell's, yeah, they have the, 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 the numbers to be in. Well, unfortunately, the comparison is comparing a very low bar. Oh, yeah. They should, um, well, if it's short stop to a second baseman, which short stops get more latitude. Right. That's true. But speaking of short stops that should eventually be in is Omar Vizquel. I agree. I, I think he'll get in eventually. Yeah, his, problem is, so. he, his problem is he flew, he's flown so far under the radar. That but he got 37 take a little while. the first try. Yeah, which, which kind of, but the, the, the if problem with Omar was he didn't every do day, a backflip. I've never seen a guy yeah. with with softer hands. He, he was in a, an accurate, incredible arm, and he was at the in the final stages of his career when I saw him out here in San Francisco, and um, he was incredible. He knew where to play. Um, wow, he was good, and I hope he gets in. He was a decent hitter. I mean, first dress up. For a shortstop, yes, and a great fielder. Um, I can't think of – speaking of great fielders, um, of all the shortstops playing today, Crawford of the Giants. No, I haven't seen enough of him. 
Yeah, um, I get to see him a lot. And, yeah. Uh, so I'm like, but that's a, that's a good example of um, you know we see the guys in our region, the guys that um, you know are on TV a lot. Uh, hey, good show, guys. This is okay. Fun. Okay. All right. Next week, same time, same same bad time, same bad channel. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you, Al Blumkin. Thank you, Al Maker. Thank you for listening, everybody. Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. Adios. The proceeding was a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Thank you for listening.